Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Justin Meyer. I'm the Director of Development for the Department of Neurosurgery. I hope that we find all of you safe and well. I thank you for joining us today for our second Fridays with Friedlander event. Last week was such a success that we have truly been looking forward to today all week long. If you're unable to make last week's presentation, I'll be posting my email address in the chat box. Please feel free to send me an email to request a link to the recording or email me with any questions or comments you may have. All of our attendees' mics are muted, but you can type a question in the QA chat box and we'll try and get to as many as we can in our allotted time. This week, we're very proud to highlight another extraordinary expert physician and faculty member of UPMC and the University of Pittsburgh Department of Neurosurgery, Dr. Bradley Gross. But first, I would like to welcome our Chairman of Neurosurgery, Dr. Robert Friedlander, to give an update on the happenings from the last week. Dr. Friedlander, thank you, and please take it away. Uh, thank you, Justin. And again, I want to welcome you all to um, the second edition of uh, this uh, event. Uh, we had uh, very positive feedback uh, last uh, over the past uh, several days regarding the, the last event and people asking many questions on uh, what's uh, happening in the Department of uh, Neurosurgery. So uh, first, I wanted to tell you a little bit about my week. And as you can tell, I'm not wearing um, uh, a jacket or tie. I'm not wearing my scrubs, which are, it's usually my two outfits uh, during uh, the week. I'm wearing my uh, home clothes and uh, I'm having an opportunity to be at home. I'm still uh, on back-to-back -back, uh, phone calls uh, all day and conference calls regar regarding uh, the uh, COVID situation and how do we best uh, uh, manage it. So it's a, it's been an interesting uh, week. Again, just to recap uh, my week on um, Monday, I've been in the hospital part of the time and part of the time at home. Uh, on Monday, I was uh, at the hospital and uh, took uh, care with the surgeon, a patient that had a stroke that we did a, it's called a carotid endarterectomy to clean up uh, his carotid uh, artery. Tuesday, I was uh, working from home, as I said, uh, back to back uh, calls uh, pretty much. Uh, Wednesday, I went back to the hospital. Uh, we had clinic and what's uh, been really uh, interesting and transformative is what our clinic is like now. Uh, we're doing approximately 80% of our patients, we're seeing them through telemedicine. So because uh, COVID situation is out there, doesn't mean that our patients uh, don't still need us, don't still have diseases that progress in advance. So we've always wanted to make sure as our Department of Neurosurgery to follow up with our patients, uh, to provide them a venue to talk to us, to our nurses or uh, our physician assistants. So we still have a clinic uh, and the clinic is uh, quite uh, uh, busy as you can uh, imagine. So obviously we're working through this uh, process to make sure that patients 100% uh, have access uh, to us and we're taking uh, care of them. Uh, yesterday, I took care of a patient with a large uh, brain tumor. So obviously that was in the hospital. One of the things we can't do through telemedicine yet is a uh, surgery. So I was at the hospital taking care of a, uh, a patient and uh, she did uh, very well. Hopefully she'll be able to go home today as well as from clinic. I admitted a patient that, that needed our help uh, uh, in uh, the hospital. So uh, that was uh, my Thursday and Friday. Here I am on back-to-back -back calls. Don't have to wear a jacket or a tie. Um, I can't get used to it because I know once we get the uh, Restart it. Uh, be back in the hospital in, in our usual manner, and uh, and that's uh, that. Wanted to update you all on what we're doing with uh, COVID. Is uh, a Department of Neurosurgery, uh, the you know, uh, you know Pittsburgh in general and Western Pennsylvania. The penetration of COVID has not been uh, very uh, significant, which is uh, which is terrific because uh, uh, it uh, really hasn't affected us uh, very uh, very. Much, even though the economy is closed, the city is closed, and uh, you can't go anywhere much like uh, the rest of the U.S., but we've been fortunate not to have significant penetration in our uh, city or western Pennsylvania in general. But now knowing that uh, the uh, situation is as is, and uh, you know, from a hospital point of view, there, there's several components. One, can we handle the flow of patients that are COVID positive and absolutely uh, our our numbers are, are really uh, uh, been low. I, I, every one of them counts, but they have been low. But what's important is that the UPMC has incredible capacity to take care of many, many additional patients if they need uh, 
our care, but uh, we feel fairly confident that that's not going to happen at this point in terms of a, a surge that uh, is going to overwhelm us. So with that said, and as I spoke last week, uh, we're progressively starting to revamp our services to our patients. Uh, again, people are talking about elective surgery. I don't believe that uh, anything that we do in neurosurgery is really elective. Uh, I, I would categorize it more as urgent, emergent, or scheduled. Schedule doesn't mean that doesn't need to be done. It just needs to be done. And the more you delay it, uh, potentially patients can have uh, consequences uh, uh, from that. So we're uh, um, uh, in a very thoughtful manner. Uh, we're uh, revamping our operative neurosurgical uh, services, and that's all happening in a setting that's as safe as, a, as I could ever imagine. Every patient that comes into the hospital gets a question and to see if they were, uh, uh, have any contacts with uh, COVID positive patients. As an example, everybody gets their, their temperature measured, they get a mask uh, before they come into the hospital. Uh, visitation has been uh, uh, limited to a great extent. So again, the hospital is a fairly safe environment uh, for people to be in. Uh, I feel fairly safe going into the hospital myself and doing whatever I need to be, whatever needs to be done. Understanding that there's a risk uh, and everything in life has a risk. As a healthcare worker, we sign up uh, to, to medicine and to take care of patients, knowing that it, sometimes there may be a risk and things that we have to sacrifice for ourselves and for our families. But uh, for us, it's incredibly important to take care of our patients. So that's something that uh, we're doing. We're revamping our services in a, uh, as safe of a situation as we can in and out of uh, the OR. So that's uh, the uh, COVID update that I have uh, at this point. Uh, UPMC, we're open and we want to take care of, uh, of our patients. We want to make sure nobody uh, suffers any undue consequences because uh, they were hesitant to come uh, into, into the hospital. Now, um, as I discussed uh, last week, uh, part of uh, this uh, uh, webinar is to present what the Department of Neurosurgery is uh, doing, the new research, new healthcare, new care management uh, uh, protocols that we have uh, for our patients. And uh, I know that uh, uh, Justin uh, Meyer will uh, introduce our uh, next uh, speaker, but I wanted to say a few personal words uh, about uh, Dr. Bradley uh, Gross. Uh, Dr. Gross, I met a number of years ago when I was still in Boston, uh, 10 years ago or so. I interviewed him when he uh, came into his uh, uh, interview uh, for neurosurgery residency. He did his neurosurgery residency at the Brigham in Boston, where I was at before I came uh, to Pittsburgh. And he is just a phenomenal uh, physician, a phenomenal uh, teacher. Residents love him. Uh, to me, uh, you know, I work really, really closely with him because we're in the same subspecialty. We do different things. And uh, just a phenomenal uh, individual, great family uh, that, that he has uh, as well. So uh, I'll pass it over to uh, Justin to, uh, to say a few uh, additional words about uh, uh, Dr. Gross. And at the end, uh, if people have questions, uh, either about his presentation or COVID or to me or anything like that, obviously we'll be happy to address. Uh, Justin. Thank you, Dr. Friedlander. Uh, we're not only honored to have Dr. Gross with us here today, but we're also honored to have him practicing and performing research at UPMC and the University of Pittsburgh. Dr. Gross is an assistant professor and director of endovascular neurosurgery in the Department of Neurological Surgery at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. Dr. Gross specializes in cerebrovascular neurosurgery for the treatment of brain and spinal cord vascular disorders, such as aneurysms, arteriovenous malformations, arteriovenous fistulas, and cavernous malformations. His other clinical inter interests include embolization of brain and spinal cord tumors, cervical, intracranial, and venous stenting, and re revascularization for acute ischemic stroke. Dr. Gross's research is concentrated in cerebrovascular neurosurgery and has written over 100 peer-reviewed articles and books and chapters. So Dr. Gross, please take it away. Thank you. I appreciate the uh, kind introduction. It's certainly my pleasure to speak to all of you this afternoon about the management of ischemic stroke here at UPMC. Can we switch over to my slides? Thank you. So when we think about ischemic stroke, there are really two kinds of stroke in general. Um, ischemic stroke is one of the two types. Ischemic stroke refers to the blockage of a blood vessel. And as a result of this, 
there is loss of blood flow to a part of the brain. And when there's a loss of blood flow to the part of the brain, the neurons in that area begin to dysfunction and can ultimately die. This picture down in the bottom here beneath this ischemic stroke category shows an angiogram. This is an injection of the carotid artery and the patient has a blockage of its main continuation, the middle cerebral artery. This patient is having an acute ischemic stroke. Now, the other type of stroke is hemorrhagic stroke, which simply refers to the rupture of a blood vessel, which results in bleeding into the brain. When this occurs, neurons can be compressed or damaged and can lose function, akin to an ischemic stroke. But in addition to that, the pressure in the brain can become elevated, resulting in a neurosurgical emergency. These are two fairly simple examples of hemorrhagic stroke. In this CAT scan that you see over here, there is bleeding diffusely in the spaces of the brain. This is something called the subarachnoid hemorrhage. Most commonly when spontaneous, this is the result of an aneurysm rupture. This other pain in the bottom right is another type of hemorrhagic stroke. This is called an intraparenchymal hemorrhage, where the bleeding is within the brain substance itself, perhaps in general most commonly from high blood pressure. So our focus today will be on acute ischemic stroke. And as a matter of fact, acute ischemic stroke accounts for 80% of all stroke. Now, when we talk about acute ischemic stroke affecting a certain side of the brain, this in general results in paralysis of the opposite side of the body. So when we look at this angiogram here, this first one in the middle, this is an injection of the carotid artery and the patient has an occlusion of the right M1, that is blockage of the right MCA, we would anticipate that they would have paralysis of the left side of the body. In this middle picture here, there is a left M1 occlusion. So this is the carotid artery on the left side and in the brain, it's a main continuing branch, the MCA is occluded. So this patient would likely have paralysis on the right side, but unfortunately, in addition, likely language difficulty or difficulty with fluency of speech. The other type of common blockage of a large artery is a basilar occlusion. This is in the back of the brain. The basilar artery is supplied by the vertebral arteries not the carotid artery. This is the left vertebral artery going up to the basilar artery, and there is a blockage. Basilar occlusion, which is less common than the other two types, but certainly occurs, um, can result in disturbance of the level of consciousness, difficulty with moving your eyes properly, and unfortunately, variable degrees of paralysis up to all four limbs because the basilar artery supplies the brain stem. That is the connection from the brain to the spinal cord. So the key question to answer is, how do we unblock this vessel to hopefully help the patient? And interestingly, that history does not go very far back. When we look to the history of the treatment of acute ischemic stroke, we can look no further back than 1995, and you can all can think back to what you were watching or doing in 1995. And it was then in 1995 that in the New England Journal of Medicine, the NINDS and stroke RTPA trial was published. Now, this was a trial that randomized patients to medical therapy versus TPA intravenously. That is the clot-busting drug that you often hear about in the lay press. TPA was given intravenously to a cohort of patients in this study, and they found that in the patients that received TPA, rates of good outcome improved from 26% in the control group to 39%. And this was the beginning of acute ischemic stroke patients. Patients were administered IV TPA within three hours, now it's within four and a half hours in appropriately selected patients, of symptom onset. The thought was that if you waited too long, the stroke would be too large, and just the risk of bleeding from the TPA would outweigh the benefit of administering the TPA. Or to 1999, the next trial. The thought for this trial was perhaps rather than giving the clot busting medicine, the TPA, into an IV, we can instead thread a tube from the artery in the leg, that is the femoral artery, thread a catheter all the way up through the aorta, all the way up to the head, and locally at the clot administer a clot busting agent. So in this study, in which UPMC was a participant in the 1990s, patients were randomized to either heparin in their intravenous line, or IA therapy, that, is, that refers to going endovascularly through the arteries in the leg up to the clot to administer TPA. And there was a pretty remarkable uh, finding in that the opening of the artery improved from 18% to 66%, and good outcomes improved from 25% to 40%. And it was with this study that the birth of endovascular therapy, that is going through the artery in the leg up to the brain, the birth of this therapy to treat acute ischemic stroke was born. And it was from this study that the six hour mark came out. So for TPA, initially we were saying three hours, perhaps four and a half hours. And then from the PROAC study, we said, well, we can go in through the leg up to six hours to potentially try to open up the clot and benefit patients. Fast forward to 2004, you can think about what you were doing then. 
uh, our technology to treat acute ischemic stroke through the leg significantly evolved with the introduction of the Mercy Retrieval device. So instead of us simply threading a tube up from the artery in the leg to the head and administering a medicine locally, we can instead try to cork the clot, try to grab it with this corkscrew-like device that is the Mercy Retriever and essentially slide out the clot and remove it. We found uh, serendipitously this group in Germany uh, that published this paper uh, in the late 2000s or around 2009, we found that this solitaire stent retriever was a better clot grasper than the Mercy Retriever device, and people started to move towards using this. This was a nice advance in our ability to remove clots uh, from the brain. However, in 2013, unfortunately, three randomized trials were published that compared patients treated with endovascular therapy to open up the artery to patients treated with best medical management. And unfortunately, these trials demonstrated that endovascular therapy as a matter of fact, did not benefit patients in terms of outcome. This was a surprising and certainly counterintuitive result. And fortunately, in 2015, a long two years later, five more modernized and better designed randomized trials clearly demonstrated the intuitive benefit that we knew uh, of endovascular therapy in opening up blood vessels and benefiting patients with acute ischemic stroke, that is blockage of their blood vessels. So just to quickly go through this graph, these are five different studies. The gray panel refers to patients treated with endovascular therapy having a good outcome. So you can see in this escape trial, for example, the rate of good outcome is this. In, contra in contrast to patients treated simply with best medical therapy, the rates of good outcomes across the board were significantly lower if you were treated medically as compared to opening up the artery. And thus endovascular therapy in the treatment of acute ischemic stroke regained its momentum. And so to go back to the question, how do we unblock the vessel? And to summarize, in 2004, we had this corkscrew mercy retrieval device to pull it out. 2012, there was the popularization of these stent retrievers to remove the clot. And then around 2013, 2014, uh, groups started discussing this ADAPT technique, this technique where you simply navigate a catheter up to the blockage, apply aspiration or apply pump suction to the catheter, and then remove the clot. When I was in Phoenix training, learning how to do ischemic strokes, we referred to this technique as the ADAPT technique. So when I came to Pittsburgh and was discussing with my future wonderful senior partners, Dr. Jankwitz and Dr. Joven, whether they used ADAPT, they very politely explained to me, well, we've actually been doing that for a lot longer. Uh, and we actually published this technique that we refer to as manual aspiration thrombectomy in 2010. So in Pittsburgh, they had been doing this technique long before uh, it had been popularized with much more challenging catheters and having wonderful results, uh, really pushing the envelope. Um, this is the actual paper from 2010 showing this technique logically referred to as manual aspiration thrombectomy, where you basically just manually try to aspirate, that is suck out the clot. Um, and so uh, this is an illustrative case of mine from about a year ago. This is a very fast and effective method to get the blood clot out. So we accessed the groin, we started the case at 2.16 p.m. You can see we have our first base catheter run here at 2.19 p.m. showing the blockage in the right MCA. We have a blockage right here. And by 2.20, we have the blood vessel open. So this is a four minute uh, puncture to recanalization case. And the thought is time is brain. The faster we can reperfuse, the faster we can regenerate blood flow to that side of the brain, the more neurons we can save from dying. That is the premise. And so I'm going to show a few illustrative videos showing how we do these. So this is a femoral thrombectomy that is going from the artery in the leg. There are some variants of that. And MAT refers to manual aspiration thrombectomy, the technique of removing the clot. Uh, and so in here, we're illustrating advancement of the catheter, the support catheter, the tube that will be supporting the tube that we then send up to the brain to remove the blood clot. So here we are. Uh, we're going to just play this video here. We are advancing the catheter. You can see it's traveling from the aorta up into the neck, and then it's parked there in the neck. And then this is a zoomed in view where we already have advanced that catheter up to the skull base and are going to be navigating a catheter from the skull base up to the brain where the blockage is. It's very fast. So I'm going to show it a couple times. There we go. We're going up into the M1 that's blocked. One last time, up into the M1 that's blocked. These catheters are very supple. 
And then once we're at the clot, we simply apply suction to the syringe and we remove it. You can see this is a very fast technique. I'll just show that one more time. We're just suctioning and removing the aspiration catheter. And then you can see these are some illustrative angiograms before and after in this patient. You can see before there's blockage of the left M1. This is the blocked blood vessel. And then after we apply this technique, this is the result. You can see the reperfusion. We've restored blood flow to that side of the brain. This is the catheter that was used. And this is what the clot actually looks like when we basically uh, apply uh, pressure and push it out of the catheter once we're out of the patient. There are certain variants to this theme. Um, as technology continues to evolve and our techniques continue to evolve, we find that for blockages in the back of the brain, potentially going through the wrist, the radial artery, gives us more direct access to get there um, in faster time. And so this is just illustrating uh, us going through into the left vertebral artery through the left wrist and advancing that base catheter. This is it coming out of the subclavian artery in the neck all the way up into the vertebral artery still in the neck in order to do a basilar thrombectomy that is opening the artery in the back of the brain. And so this is that patient. You can see that there's a blockage here at the top of the basilar artery, okay? And then we do the same technique once we have the catheter in the vertebral artery that is the base artery in the neck. We simply apply suction, remove the blockage. This is the reopen vessel. This is a zoomed out view here, just showing the catheter coming up from the wrist. This is, this is not the wrist. This is all the way in the chest here down at the base of the neck. This is the neck artery, the vertebral artery, and this is the open artery in the head. And this is just showing the approach. So the radial artery is a very useful alternative in well-selected cases, certainly to do uh, thrombectomy. This is a little bit more of an interesting application of radial artery approaches. So we are fairly aggressive in treating older patients with stroke, even though the treatment can be more challenging. Their arteries have more plaque, their arteries are more tortuous. And what we have found is, especially in patients over age 90 that have very challenging aortic arches. So this is just showing, this is a nine-year-old patient. And you can see this is the left carotid artery coming off the arch. It has a kink here. You can see we're coming up from the leg initially, and there's this very sharp angle here, which is not favorable to advanced big catheters to do the thrombectomy. There's this kink here denoted by the triangle. We really were not able to navigate a catheter from the groin up into this artery effectively. Whereas this picture shows when we converted to going from the wrist, the right radial artery, it's a much more natural course for the angulation of this left carotid artery. And again, actually, we found that in nonagenarians uh, with left carotid occlusions, uh, the right wrist is often uh, a more ideal angulation to get in there. And so in this 90-year-old patient uh, who presented with an NIH of 18, this is a measure of how debilitated they are by the stroke. This patient was paralyzed on the right side. This patient was not able to produce fluent speech. Uh, essentially left untreated in someone this age, uh, there's a, obviously an intuitively very high risk of mortality. However, through the wrist, we navigated a catheter. In this case, we used an adjunctive stent retriever to remove the clot effectively. This is the before, here's the blockage. This is the after, here's the open artery. And actually 48 hours later, the patient had an NIH. This is a stroke scale score of only one. She was discharged. She did quite well, fortunately. This is just showing the revascularization of the hemisphere here the, to the side of the brain. This is just showing us doing another radial thrombectomy. This is in a different nonagenarian patient, actually, where, again, we're coming up from the wrist. Uh, we have our catheter that's already, our base catheter is already in the neck, and we're going to navigate our aspiration catheter from the wrist up here. So I'm just going to play this video just showing navigation from the wrist. So there's the catheter coming up into the neck, it's coming out now from the base catheter very slowly. Here it comes and out it goes. And then in this patient, we again, get up into the head, apply suction, remove the clot. And this is, it almost looks like the same picture at the end. This is a left M1 occlusion. This is the open artery. And again, the goal here is to do it as swiftly as possible. There's certainly a large number of cases, probably still the majority that are best treated through the leg, but as catheter technology evolves, uh, we may be treating more and more through the wrist as that be can become a more effective approach, certainly in patients with arch tortuosity. So at UPMC, we do a lot of strokes. This is about a month and a half of my own cases. Uh, we keep very busy with them. Um, 
When we look interestingly at our stroke volumes uh, from 2019 to 2020, early this year before COVID hit, we had a bit of an uptick actually. These are our monthly stroke thrombectomy volumes. These are cases to where we go through the leg and open up the artery. You can see a bit of an uptick from 2019 to 2020. Even in March, um, there's a bit of an uptick. Uh, April's not done yet, and this slide's a couple days old. This number's probably a bit higher. Um, you can see we do over 300 thrombectomy cases per year. Uh, interestingly, so far in Pittsburgh, none of our patients have tested positive for COVID. Now, obviously, we have some patients with dubious histories that we take appropriate precautions for, COVID precautions, and several of those patients have been tested, but all thus far have been actually COVID negative. There's been some interesting discussion from New York where COVID is obviously more prevalent, where they're hypothesizing a potential hypercoagulable state, that is a state where you're more prone to potentially have strokes in younger patients. We have not yet seen that in Pittsburgh, but that may be just a function of the prevalence of COVID here. So we've had no COVID positive uh, cases that have undergone thrombectomy thus far, humbly. Uh, a question that Dr. Freelander asked me that's a fairly intuitive question is, is it taking us longer to treat these patients in the COVID era? So I just was able to take my own cases. I've done about 30 or so cases uh, since the start of the year, and I looked sort of before the COVID era, so before March 8th and then after March 16th when I was back on call during the era. Uh, about 21 cases were done in the first couple months, 11 cases in the last month by myself. And when we looked at the median time from when the patient was last normal to the puncture, so time from initial presentation, time from initiation of symptoms to presentation to the hospital, we see that the uh, median time from last normal was six hours, and then that increased to eight hours in patients that presented during the COVID era, that is over the last month. So that difference is not statistically significant. Uh, however, it will be interesting to see when we have more patients, perhaps, if that's a real finding that actually it's unfortunately that patients are taking longer to present to the hospital. Our median procedural times have not significantly changed uh, during that period. It's about 25 minutes from puncture to recanalization on average. That's a function of how many times we try to open up, need to open up the artery, how many passes we take. An interesting thing about stroke workflow at UPMC is speaking about trying to make these cases move along quickly, getting the artery open quickly is our direct transfer to the angio suite approach. This is a great paper that Dr. Jada, my partner, was first author on, uh, where we looked at patients that went directly to the angio suite for treatment versus those that made a pit stop or that perhaps presented first the emergency department. So when we get calls from other hospitals with patients with known or high suspicion for blockage of a major artery in the brain, we try to transfer all of those patients directly to the angiography suite for revascularization. We do not transfer those patients to the ER as best as we can. And when we looked in this study, the mean time from arrival to Presbyterian to reopening of the artery went down from 125 minutes for those that came through the ER to only 66 minutes from when they were directly transferred to the angio suite. And this really guides how we try to manage transfers in particular to UPMC. We really try to get them to the angio suite as soon as possible, as time is brain, so to speak. But that may not be the whole story. An absolute landmark study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2018, the Dawn study from Dr. Tudor Joven here at UPMC when this was published, and Dr. Raul Nagara from Emory. These are two absolute visionaries in interventional neurology. It was beyond an honor and a privilege to have been able to work with Dr. Tudor Joven and learn from him. I'm forever indebted to everything I've learned from him as I uh, humbly discuss uh, this remarkable trial. So, this trial looked at patients who presented outside the classic stroke window, outside within six hours of last seen well, so to speak. They looked at patients presenting from six to 24 hours of last seen well, who had what we called small cores. So rather than just looking at time, we looked at how much of the brain was already dead or affected, and then looked at how much of the brain we could potentially salvage. So what we refer to as the core of the stroke, that is the area of the brain that has already died. And what we refer to as the penumbra is the amount of brain we could potentially save. And what this trial looked at is it randomized patients greater than six hours from last seen well to opening up the blood vessel, endovascular therapy, 
or best medical management, because potentially if endovascular therapy did not benefit these patients this far out from last seen well, it can only potentially harm them from the complications of it. We wanted to know whether or not we'd be helping patients that presented over six hours from last seen well. UPMC was the top enroller in the Dawn study. Uh, you can see we enrolled 46 patients in the Dawn study, and the findings were absolutely remarkable from the Dawn study. So I'm going to go through these. So Trevo refers to the stent trever that was used to help open up the artery. So Trevo refers to the intervention arm, and MM refers to medical management, that is patients that didn't undergo reopening of the blood vessel. This first measure, called the weighted MRS, was a very thoughtful approach that weighted good outcomes very heavily and not only death necessarily is a bad outcome, but also disposition to a nursing home or debilitation very heavily negatively. So this was a functional outcome scale. And patients that were treated with interventional therapy had significantly better outcomes than patients that were treated with best medical management. It's actually quite remarkable, this difference reached statistical significance. In addition, the more traditional modified Rankin scale good outcome rates were 49% for patients treated with endovascular therapy, that is with opening up the artery, versus patients not treated with endovascular therapy with best medical management, 13%. And the treatment effect was one of the strongest treatment effects in all of medicine. This number needed to treat for 90-day functional independence refers to how many patients we need to do this procedure on to get one patient that is functionally independent in 90 days. And this treatment effect of 2.8, that is three patients to get one good outcome, is absolutely profound and remarkable. And this study, really has changed the face of stroke therapy around the world. It is remarkable and fortunate they were able to benefit far more patients that present with blockages of major blood vessels in this brain, in their brain. And I wanted to look back into my own database. I didn't have to look far. This was, I was on call last week. This was a case I just did last week. This is a quote unquote Don patient. This is a patient who was in their 70s, who was last well the day before. Uh, they presented in the morning. They were last seen well the day before. They had an NIH score of 21. That means they were very debilitated from this blockage. This patient had paralysis of the right side of the body and an inability to speak. So they went to an outside hospital. And now thanks to the Don study, it's generally considered standard of care to get this study called CT perfusion. That is the study that looks at how much tissue is dead. And this patient had a small core, small amount of dead tissue and a large penumbra, a large amount of tissue that has not yet died, but is at risk. So when we got this phone call from the other hospital, from the emergency department, we said, transfer this patient directly to the Presby Angio suite so we can reopen the blood vessel. This patient arrived to, the Pres to Presby at 2.20 p.m. We punctured the groin at 2.39. The blood vessel was opened by 2.54. And by the next day, the patient was almost normal. She had a little bit of slurring of her speech, but was otherwise uh, normal. So this was a nice uh, success case in reopening the artery. And this, again, in some centers before the Dawn study, this patient may have not been considered a candidate for revascularization. And she may have had a very large stroke or even died as a result of this blockage. As a brief tangent, when we talk about stroke prevention, one of the sources of these blockages in the brain could be the carotid artery in the neck. So this is an angiogram of a patient who's had a minor stroke, who did not present acutely, who has this plaque right here in the neck and resultant narrowing. Dr. Friedlander talked about how he did a carotid end arterectomy earlier this week. That is a surgical option to reopen the artery. We also have endovascular options to open the artery as well. So in this patient, we went uh, through the wrist and we deployed a stent to reopen the artery successfully and reduce the risk of stroke in the patient. And we do a good number of carotid stents here at UPMC. This is a, probably a couple months worth of my own cases where uh, these are some before and after pictures uh, of stenting. And the benefit of stenting is we can do it fairly swiftly. We like to have what we call our EPD up to down times so within 10 minutes. What that means is when we cross the plaque, we deploy a net to block any plaque from going up when we deploy the stent. And our time from deployment of the net to removal of the net to basically when the artery is open, we like to keep under 10 minutes. So it can be a fairly swift procedure. Now, sometimes we have to open the neck and the head simultaneously acutely. Uh, and what I mean by that is, so this was a patient I treated just last week, another Dawn patient, last well at three in the morning. And here we have a catheter in the carotid artery and we're injecting and there's no flow going to the head because there's this blockage right here down in the neck, a severe, severe narrowing and there's really no flow going up to the head. 
So this patient was last well at three in the morning. He was referred to us from an outside hospital. We transferred him directly to the angiography suite. He arrived to Presbyterian at 1210. We punctured the groin at 1222. Okay, we see this. The first thing we do is we get the neck open. So we put a stent there at 1235. We then had to open the head blockage in two passes and had the brain open by 1303. That is in less than an hour from arrival to the hospital. And so to explain these figures, this is the before picture. This is the after picture. The neck is open, the head is open. This is a zoomed in picture of the stent that's being placed in the neck. This is a picture of the head being revascularized. And this patient fortunately did quite well after we opened up the artery. This is uh, in the back of the brain when we have the same problem. So this patient has a blockage in their vertebral artery, that is the artery that goes to the back of the brain, as well as a blockage in the head. So in these cases though, I like to open up the head first. So we go through the blockage in the neck, we open up the head. This is the before picture. And this is what it's supposed to look like after we aspirated out the clot. And then on the way out, this is the before picture. This is the narrowing in the neck. This is the after picture where we leave uh, stent in the artery in the neck to open it up. So we're getting to a little bit more complex procedures as we go from simply aspirating out the blood clot to now treating the source of the blood clot with stenting. And then potentially there's even a more difficult variant to treat. And this is where the plaque or the source of the blockage is right in the brain itself. So most of these blockages, when we say we're trying to suck out the blood clot or aspirate out the blood clot, the clot has come from either the heart, most commonly, or perhaps from the neck. But rarely, in a small subset of patients, the problem is not the heart or the neck. It's actually that the artery itself in the brain has plaque and the plaque has closed off. So the artery has gotten narrower and narrower until it's just blocked off and the problem is in the brain. We don't know this necessarily initially. So this is a patient with a blockage in their basilar artery in the back of the brain. This is the initial run. And then after we open the blockage, you can see this blue arrow showing there's some irregularity. There's some narrowing in the artery there. And this is sort of a telltale sign that the problem was actually the artery itself in place. Now, a mistake to make is that you look at this and say, oh, there's some narrowing, it's open, we're done. Because if you wait a few minutes, or sometimes it can be up to an hour, gradually that hot area, so to speak, that hot plaque as we would call it, will gradually often re-stenose, re-narrow, and actually clot off. This is a very common finding if you wait and watch these things. And so we need to leave a permanent solution, a permanent stent there so we can keep the artery open. And that's what this is illustrating here. This is a stent, a coronary stent. This is a stent that's mounted on a balloon that we pass up into the head and we inflate the balloon to deploy the stent so that after the artery is open. Uh, there was a dedicated intracranial stent system, meaning a stent system that was designed to be used in the head, but it's really not practical to be used in acute stroke because in, these, uh, in that system, the system requires multiple what we call exchanges, multiple passes. These patients are often awake. Uh, the advantage of using these coronary systems is it's much faster. You just have to be very uh, delicate with them because there's a risk of rupturing the vessel and you have to be very precise with your measurements. We actually recently published our experience using these balloon mounted coronary stents in the treatment of acute stroke due to intrinsic disease, meaning disease of the vessel itself. This is uh, one example here. This is another example where we deploy these coronary stents to keep the blood vessel open. And when I looked at my own stroke series of cases that I've done at UPMC. I've done 304 uh, stroke thrombectomy cases at UPMC. And the frequency in which I need to deploy a stent in the neck is about 15%. That is when there's a plaque in the neck that has caused a blockage in the head, it's about 15%, most often in the, in the carotid artery. I've only done a couple in the vertebral artery. Uh, however, a small but not insignificant proportion of cases, that is 7%, I've had to deploy intracranial stents because of atherosclerotic disease, meaning plaque that's actually in the head that's gonna re-clot off if I don't open it up. Here's another example of a blockage in the back of the brain due to plaque in the basilar artery here that we was an ideal candidate to be treated through the radial artery, which gives us nice access there. So we went through the wrist, uh, went up to the head, and you can see this is right after we deploy the stent, the artery looks almost normal. This is the uh, before picture, we're down in the neck. Here's the narrowing. Here's the after picture from down in the neck, and here's the open blood vessel there. 
So uh, just a final variant twist of using these intracranial stents. Uh, we're kind of getting more and more complicated. This may be a bit of an intriguing case to some of the healthcare practitioners that are looking at this. So we refer to 71 year old patient who had a prior stroke, multiple clots. His symptom onset was 8.30 in the evening. He had a very high NIH score, meaning he was very debilitated. He was paralyzed on the right side and had significant difficulty with speech. He arrived to us at 2.30 in the morning. He had a platelet count of 17,000. This is extremely low. He had a fibrinogen of 84. Th this basically means that he was probably in a state of something called DIC, meaning he is at high risk of bleeding and clotting at the same time. This is a uh, horrendous, often high mortality problem. But the bottom line is that if this patient has a major blockage in his carotid artery in his head and we do not open it up, he's going to have a major stroke if he's this affected by it. So we went in and using a combination of stents and this aspiration technique that I alluded to before, we were able to get some blood clot out. So it started in the carotid artery. Here it's still in the carotid artery. Here it's now in the middle cerebral artery. We got some blood clot out, but unfortunately could not completely get it out. Um, I cite this paper here uh, where we have done many thrombectomies on patients with low platelet counts. This was not included in this particular paper, but we've shown that it can be done in patients with low platelet count. And so what I resolved to do in this case, since we simply couldn't get the artery open, the clot was too, so to speak, sticky in this patient in DIC, was I resolved to use these stiff coronary stents to basically force open the artery, to basically break apart the clot using these non-compliant coronary stents. And you can see this is the before picture. There's tons of clot in the artery. This is the stent that's deployed. This is the after picture where we have a nice revascularization result. Um, and even though this patient was in DIC, we did give him some blood thinners to maintain the stent open. We gave some Plavix after the procedure. And this is the MRI after the procedure. The MRI is what shows a stroke burden. It's these little bright little dots. A lot of the hemisphere has been preserved. And probably because the patient was put on aspirin and Plavix and was in DIC, we did have a little bit of bleeding into a stroke area in the basal ganglia. But overall, this is a fairly nice revascularization result. And again, when you think about how much you have to lose if you don't get the blood vessel open, the bottom line is we need to get these blood vessels open and help these patients. So in summary, I just want to say that UPMC has a very rich endovascular history. It dates all the way back to when Dr. Charles Kerber was here in the 1970s doing seminal work with glue, one of the original things that was used to embolize, that is treat things through the artery and the leg. Some of the absolute seminal endovascular work was done right here at UPMC. Uh, I would say anecdotally as well that Dr. Kerber was one of the early radiology advocates for neurosurgeons entering interventional neuroradiology, that is uh, endovascular, uh, and it's thanks to his advocacy that I'm probably doing what I'm doing today. Obviously, another landmark time at UPMC was Dr. Joven's work in the Don trial. Uh, like I said, it's forever changed how we treat stroke, um, and uh, it's pretty remarkable, and we remain a very... Uh, busy practice here. The UPMC Stroke Institute is absolutely remarkable. Uh, just so many publications coming out from it. We have wonderful research fellows, Shashvat Desai. Uh, our endovascular fellows cannot say enough amazing things about Dr. Chinetti, Dr. Stone, uh, our up and coming Dr. Shah and Dr. Dolia as well, very involved, publishing left and right. This is the work of all of the wonderful people that I get to work with. Um, this is just a slide highlighting, again, Dr. Stone and Dr. Tinetti, both research and in the Angio Suite, phenomenal senior fellows. And I would be very remiss if I didn't acknowledge uh, the phenomenal new addition to the Stroke Institute, endovascular and neurosurgery, Dr. Michael Lang. Uh, he is well versed in both the open and endovascular treatment of diseases of the blood vessel. He is a uh, very well versed in bypass techniques, a very complex neurosurgical procedure. Here he's teaching our fellows how to do a bypass. It's, it's really remarkable the things that he's already added to our department in such a short time. We're very lucky to have a wonderful guy like him. Uh, and in closing, I, I obviously have to warmly acknowledge the wonderful people that I work with uh, on almost a daily basis. Uh, Dr. Jadov, the director of the Stroke Institute, I've known him for 12 years. Uh, his IQ is probably about double mine. I've learned so much from him and I'm fortunate to have him as a partner. Uh, that's me here. Dr. Narayanan, a recent addition to interventional neurology and endovascular practitioner with over 10 years of experience. This is Dr. Lang. This is Dr. Kavit Shah, uh, one of our junior endovascular fellows. This is Dr. Tanetti, who along with Dr. Stone are our senior endovascular fellows. 
Dr. Dolia, our junior Novaster fellow. Dr. Brown has already graduated. This picture was taken some time ago. Uh, he's now doing some great work in New Orleans. This is Taylor, our tech manager. She's a nurse and our tech manager, very involved. Uh, Mike and Jason uh, also have to acknowledge our techs that are not pictured. Obviously, uh, Rita and Jim, along with uh, Air and Stacy. Uh, we work with absolutely wonderful people. Very fortunate to have such a great group of people that I work with. And with that, uh, I have left a good amount of time for questions. I'm happy to entertain any questions, and I appreciate your attention. So thank you, Dr. Gross. Uh, I'll, make a, I'll make a couple of comments as we uh, um, uh, provide an opportunity for, for questions. You know, one of the uh, um, interesting and great things about uh, the UPMC Department of Neurosurgery and the neurosciences in general is how subspecialized our practitioners are. The fact that we're uh, such a large department, uh, as a matter of fact, the largest department of neurosurgery in the country, uh, allows us the opportunity to become really, really subspecialized. And when you're very subspecialized, you get very good at uh, doing the procedures that you do. Uh, we have large number of uh, uh, both bread and butter and complicated cases that come not only from Western Pennsylvania, where most of our patients uh, uh, do come from, but plenty of patients come from around the country and as a matter of fact, from all over the world, seeking the care of our uh, really, truly expert subspecialists as Dr. Gross uh, is and described all the work uh, that, that he did. One of the things that is really important for us is the degree of cooperation between the cerebrovascular uh, center. Uh, we go and we evaluate uh, one patient at a time and we make sure to provide the very, very best advice that we can uh, for them be it an endovascular procedure or an open surgical uh, procedure, discussing it with the patient, but really working with the team. The team is, is the key, and uh, you know, I would trust any of the people that are that are part of our department. Uh, a couple of other comments regarding Dr. Gross's presentation is uh, you know, a little bit of where I started at the beginning of the talk, where the hospital is a safe place, UPMC, uh, it's taken a lot of uh, uh, opportunities to make our environment uh, safer, and uh, patients uh, really need to make sure to come and seek our help when uh, needed. Uh, you know, Dr. Grill showed uh, where there were some patients that were coming in a little bit later, maybe not significant at this point, but uh, likely it's a trend uh, having a, a stroke uh, where it, uh, time is brain and brain is uh, time. Patients need to come in uh, as quickly as needed. And, and, you know, the more and more that I hear, but people are hesitating coming to the hospital, both either with heart attacks or with neurosurgical um, uh, diseases or, or problems. Uh, it's really important for, for the patients uh, to uh, know that it's important to come in. And all that we've learned in society where, you know, if you have chest pain, go to the hospital. If you have symptoms of a stroke, go to the hospital. Or if you have certain kinds of pain that are really unusual, at least call your providers to make sure that you don't delay care because it's a shame if uh, people suffer um, uh, consequences uh, due to delayed uh, care in an environment that is uh, very safe uh, to come into uh, the hospital. Dr. Gross presented a number of uh, studies and what's, what's important to know, and again, of relevance to the, uh, to the COVID situation right now is that the results of studies are related to how well the studies are designed if a study is not designed properly, then you might not get the result that is, I'll, I'll call it accurate, not necessarily the result that you want, but the result that's accurate, which is what we really want at the end. So a lot of these stroke studies, they were designed really in a masterful way to be able to uh, achieve the results that were um, that, that we knew were there, but there was uh, the uh, uh, you know, people tried and tried until the, 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 the right uh, studies were done. And similarly, it's happening likely with uh, COVID where there are lots of different therapies which uh, people um, are trying and evaluating, but it's, it's really key to try them on the right patient and in, in, in the right uh, uh, circumstance. So that's all uh, really important information. Uh, finally, uh, talk about additional research into stroke uh, uh, evaluation. Uh, a number of uh, people from our institution and our laboratories, including my own, we're studying uh, neuroprotective agents to both Dr. Gross uh, talked about the amount of time that we have to open an artery before there's uh, irreparable 
damage. The other part is the, the, the pharmacological approach where in addition to opening the artery, which is the gold standard, if there's no blood going to the brain, then you can't really save it. But there are drugs that we're studying to really extend the amount of time that, uh, that uh, the brain can withstand without proper uh, blood flow. So I wanted to make uh, those comments. So I want to turn it over to Justin uh, to uh, moderate the Q&A session at this point. Thank you, Dr. Freelander. Thank you, Dr. Gross. Um, just incredible information, and it's really incredible, the uh, research that's coming out of the University of Pittsburgh Department of Neurosurgery. So we're going to begin, begin the uh, Q&A portion of the presentation. We'll try and answer as many questions as we can in our allotted time. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Gross, one of the questions here, do we have any local evidence to support the conversation out of New York suggesting that mild COVID cases should be taking into coagulants, or is that still under consideration in the science community? Right. So as I said, I am a, I'm an endovascular neurosurgeon, so I'm not managing any of the minor stroke cases, but I could speak to the fact that at this point, and I really think this is just because of the prevalence of COVID in Pittsburgh being so much lower than New York, we actually have not treated any younger patients yet via thrombectomy for acute ischemic stroke. So we don't have any evidence to, the, to that effect yet, but I think it's just because of the sampling here in Pittsburgh. I think we should take that caution very seriously, but at this point, we're not necessarily re making any of those firm recommendations. Um, that does make me want to make a brief comment about the importance of the fact that what's unique about UPMC is that we have an absolutely phenomenal relationship between our stroke neurologists and neurosurgeons, uh, you know, beginning with Dr. Joven and Dr. Jankowitz, and now, you know, myself and Dr. Jada, and Dr. Narayan and Dr. Lang. And, and so, you know, we refer each other a lot of cases and we, we, we collaborate a lot. And I would say that on that front, um, that would be more under the realm of my partners like Dr. Jada and Narayan and our neurologist to comment more on the smaller stroke side. But I can at least say on the bigger stroke side, we have not yet made any formal recommendations to that effect. Thank you. Um, another question here. What do you think, why do you think more and more young people are suffering from strokes and what can we do about it? Absolutely, that's, that's an unfortunate finding. And young people suffering from strokes is reflective of younger people suffering from more cardiac disease as well. Uh, what's good for the brain, I say, is good for the heart and vice versa. So what you know is good for your heart, that is, eating a good diet, exercise, blood pressure control, control of your uh, cholesterol as well, if that's an issue, those are ways to reduce the risk of stroke uh, along with heart attack. It, it's a one-to-one -one correlation. And that's what a lot of our strokes come from at the end of the day. It's heart disease, it's carotid disease, and it's sad to see it happening in younger patients. In addition, rare sources of stroke in younger patients are, is, is if they suffer from a trauma and have something called a dissection, that is a tear in the artery. I have a few cases of those where we've had to stent the dissection and then open up the uh, blockage in the head, although that's a fairly rare source of stroke. Okay, great, thank you. Um, to what degree do you think genetics plays a role in strokes? That's, that's a fairly charged question in that genetics can obviously impact your tendency to have a heart attack or a stroke from the same perspective that it can affect your cholesterol level and so forth. So uh, it is certainly a factor. And again, stroke is a very broad term. There's uh, ischemic stroke, which uh, could certainly be impacted as such. Um, the same with hemorrhagic stroke, your tendency to develop aneurysms is certainly uh, genetic uh, to a known extent. Uh, and so that certainly is a factor. But nevertheless, uh, going back to the question just before this, the bottom line is take care of yourself. Go out for a run, uh, eat healthy, and uh, see your doctors, control your blood pressure, control your cholesterol, because that's the bottom line thing you have control over. Okay, great. Um, a question here sort of re related to the coronavirus and stroke. What uh, recent news reports say that there could be a connection between coronavirus and stroke? What are your thoughts? Right, so at this point, I, I do like to be evidence-based. And um, since I haven't actually treated a patient, I have not actually treated a single po coronavirus positive patient yet. So last month, I, I, the, my numbers were down. I think I did about 35 cases uh, thus far over the month of April, um, which, which is a lot less than what we normally do. Um, and a few patients were tested. We took precautions, but none were positive. So I don't wanna make any resounding statements uh, based, based on that based on that. But nevertheless, my ears are open to New York uh, and to some of the more affected pay, uh, places. And we'll see, hopefully we don't 
have as many patients afflicted and we don't start seeing that. But uh, again, there is certainly some preliminary evidence out of New York that I think we need to listen to carefully and see how that evolves. Okay, uh, couple uh, couple questions related to, to your um, your profession here. What what made you practice endovascular neurosurgery? No, that's that's a that's a fun question. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, like I like I've already said in my talk, I've had the privilege to be exposed to some pretty remarkable people in neurosurgery and and neurology um, that have uh, really molded where I am today. Uh, I, I it would it would take me twenty minutes to explain all that, but basically, when I was a med student at Northwestern. Uh, one of the true visionaries in, in open nerve surgery, Hunt Bacher, is who turned me on to diseases of the blood vessels, aneurysms, a very charismatic leader there. And uh, I became initially completely enthralled with um, hemorrhagic stroke, that is aneurysms and AVMs and things that bleed in the brain. Um, but at the same time, they had a very ingenuitive uh, endovascular practitioner there, Bernard Bendock, along with Ali Shabani. And they taught me and introduced me to endovascular. And it, it clearly, it was in a relative sense of infancy back then. Uh, and it's just remarkable to see the evolution of techniques that we have, things that we couldn't do two years ago, we're doing now. It's just such a rapidly evolving field. And that's what keeps me so excited to be a part of uh, that evolution to help to work with people and companies to develop better catheters and better devices. It, it's just an incredibly exciting field. And the bottom line and the greatest source of excitement and enjoyment is when you see your patients do well. You see a patient come in very ill and you're able to make them better. It's incredibly rewarding, incredibly humbling sometimes, but incredibly rewarding as well. And that's why I love what I do. That's wonderful. And it looks like we have about, uh, we have room for about one more question and I think it's a pretty good one to end on. What made you uh, decide to practice at UPMC? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, UPMC, has multiple unique facets and some honestly I didn't even know till I got here. I, I knew Dr. Friedlander for very many years. I knew he would be a, a warm and supportive chairman and he certainly has been. Um, the faculty here are all in their own respects visionaries. I mean it's just remarkable. You look at our skull base department, our epilepsy department, our spine department, that they're, it's just inundated with leaders and uh, truly innovative people. And so that that's at the outset was a remarkable allure. Um, but more specifically for me personally, I have to say the allure was the people that were practicing endovascular here um, were well beyond their years uh, and were great people. And when you come here and you're inundated with a remarkable caseload, um, which I also had, I was fortunate to do, I, got, I think over 500 cases my first year, I think 750 cases last year, largely endovascular. Um, you develop a lot of experience and you get good quick. And uh, so we can deliver excellent care to our patients and do it with a cohesive, wonderful group of people. I mean, working with Tudor Jovin and Brian and Ashu and now Dr. Lang and Dr. Narayanan, it's, it's really a blessing to work with such incredible people and certainly a huge draw to working at UPMC. I couldn't think of a better way to wrap us up at exactly 2 p.m., doctor. Thank you. Um, Thank you. On behalf of uh, UPMC, University of Pittsburgh, uh, Dr. Friedlander, Dr. Gross, uh, we thank you all for joining us today. Uh, please keep a lookout for next week's presentation link in your email. We look forward to seeing everybody soon. Be safe and be well, everyone. Thank you so much.